Hey everybody, and thanks so much for joining us today for Horizon's second online service. We are so glad that you have chosen to come and worship with us today. We want you to remember that as you're watching the service online, you can also be participating with us through our Connect page, which is available at horizoncc.com. You just go to, go to that page, our main web page, and then you click on the HCC online banner like you see right here. And and that will take you to our Connect page where you can interact with us through things like prayer requests, giving options, there's sermon notes there, uh, ways for you to sign up for things. And so we want you to be able to have access to that throughout the service so that you can interact with us. Another way that you can interact with us as well, if you're watching on Facebook, you can be throwing emojis and dropping comments all along the way. Uh, because uh, you, can, you can interact with us uh, that way through Facebook. And friends, we really enjoy interacting with you throughout the service time together. And one of the first things that we want you to do if you're on that uh, Connect page is let us know that you're here. And all you have to do is go to the Connect section on that page and uh, type in your name and then hit the Submit button, and then we'll know that you're with us today. Uh, if you're new here, this is your first time visiting with us, just click the little checkbox below where you type your name in, and that'll let us know that you're a first-time uh, viewer uh, with us here uh, for our online service. Um, the rest of the information that's available for you there in the, uh, the Connect page is purely optional for you to uh, be able to, to fill out. And uh, we're just glad to be able to have this time to be able to interact with you. Now, one thing that we do want to uh, uh, point out to everybody today is there, there, there may be some people who uh, are, are having some difficulty right now due to all the coronavirus restrictions. And so if you're someone who maybe is under quarantine right now or uh, you're in an age group that, um, uh, that has you um, wanting to be extra cautious and you need some help with things like buying groceries, let us know. Let us know about this and uh, you can just go to the sign up section on the Connect page, give us a little bit of a description of your situation and then someone from the church will be in contact with you to see what we can do to help you out. You know, friends, the, uh, the coronavirus situation, uh, it, has, it has all of us um, just being concerned uh, about things that are going on in our world today. And I know that there's a, a lot of caution, a lot of, uh, a lot of concern. And friends, I wanted to take just a moment uh, as, as your pastor just to give you a little bit of word of encouragement here. You know, Jesus uh, told us in, in Luke chapter 12, he said, do not worry about your life. And he goes on as he's, he's uh, giving us this, this word. He goes on there to explain to us how God provides food for the birds. And he makes the, the flowers and the, the grass grow so beautifully. And then Jesus makes the point there. He says, you know, if, if that's how God takes care of the, the grass in the field. If that's how he, he clothes the grass in the field, then how much more will he clothe you? You know, that's an important message for you and I to, to think about today. Because friends, no matter how challenging things look to us right now, we all need to remember that God is our provider. Even in times like this, even in times like this where we see those, those empty, empty shelves on, at the grocery store. Friends, even in these moments here where we're told that we need to stay away from each other, God is our provider. So Jesus tells us, do not worry about your life. God is the one who will take care of us in good times and in challenging times like this. I pray that that, that brings uh, peace to all of us, brings some encouragement to all of us, and draws our hearts into that, that mindset of worship as we worship this God who cares and provides for all of us. I raise a hallelujah In the presence of my enemy 
but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Sing that once more. My hope is built on nothing less in Jesus' blood. Our cornerstone, a rock, is in Christ alone. Cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of. on his unchanging grave and every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil yeah my anchor holds within the veil oh, oh Christ happens oftentimes I don't have to tell you this but the church is the first place that people come to for shelter for for support so even though the programming has changed we are still functioning and we're still meeting needs there's still missionaries around the globe in need of support and we're still supporting them because the church is not a building it's not a meeting house. It is a people. It's a body. And, and though we can't be together, giving and supporting still matters, and it is still an act of our worship and our declaration of trust in a faithful God. So during the season, you have three options of giving, and you can, you can click on the, the connect button down below, and you can see all those options on how to give. And if you have any trouble doing that or figuring that out, there's a form that you can fill out and someone from the church will reach out to you and, and help get that started for you. And we want to thank you for, for supporting Horizons during this time, for, for being the church and continuing to, to worship God um, during this season that we all find ourselves in. And so we're going to continue in worship together as a church, as a body. Great the chasm that lay 
between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night the darkness your loving kindness tore through
Most dictionaries define darkness as the absence of light. In other words, because the physical properties of visible light are not present, only darkness remains. Light, on the other hand, according to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, is defined as something that makes vision possible. It's light that gives us vision, gives us sight. Without light, vision and sight is impossible. Light is an amazing thing. It brings definition and clarity to a dark world around us. It shows us where the dangers are, and it also gives light to a path of safety. The mere existence of light gives testimony to God's creative power and his love. You know, the idea of light versus darkness is a fascinating concept, certainly on a a scientific level. But friends, on on a spiritual level, it's not just fascinating, it's crucial. Because all eternity hangs in the balance. You know, I think, uh, I think that this is one of the reasons why, why Jesus said, John chapter 8, He said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. See, Jesus is making the statement right there that He is the true light of the world. And like physical light, on a spiritual level, He is the one who, who brings light that shows us the, the danger and eternal consequences of sin. Yet He's also the, the, the light that, that shows us the one and only path to safety. And if we will follow Him on that path, if we will follow the true light, by placing our our faith and trust 
in Jesus Christ for salvation will follow him. We'll have that same light shining within us. Coming within us because it's implanted within us. That's what this sermon series that we're doing is, is all about. We're calling it, it Shine, and it's, it's about uh, us uh, shining the light that Christ has implanted within us to a, a world that is lost in darkness. And you know, I think one of the greatest ways for us to shine that light is to show love. To show love to those around us. By loving others, we demonstrate the, the light of Christ that is in us. And you know, that idea uh, of showing love to others, it runs throughout all the pages of Scripture. It's all over the place in the Bible and uh, examples that we see and statements that are made, stories that are told. But you know, I'd say probably the, the most concise way that it's stated is in the, the book of Leviticus, in, in chapter 19, it, it just simply says, love your neighbor as yourself. And I think that uh, in our continuing study, we're, we're kind of uh, walking our way through Romans chapter 13 as we're uh, going through this series. And uh, I think this is the, the next point that uh, the Apostle Paul really wants to emphasize uh, in, our, in our life as believers, as he's continuing on in his uh, explanation of things in uh, Romans 13, he's explaining there how we as believers in Christ uh, should uh, reflect that gift of salvation that we have uh, to the world around us, how we should be uh, acting and conducting ourselves uh, to those who don't yet know Christ. And you might remember, if you were with us last week, you might remember from our, our study last week that the Apostle Paul was encouraging believers uh, as one way of, of demonstrating this change that we have within us. He was, he was explaining to us that one of the ways that we do this is by respecting the government that we live under. Because when we respect the government that uh, under whichever country we, we live in, when we respect that government, well, we respect God's authority because God is the one who establishes that government. And when we do that, one of the key ways that we do that is by being model citizens, you know, law-abiding citizens who are, are faithful uh, to be obedient to the laws of the land. When we do that, the light of Christ uh, shines uh, through us to the world around us. And he goes on there and, and he says one, one of the key ways that we do this is by doing things like paying our taxes. And while that's not a, a, a very uh, fun subject for a lot of us to, to think about, it's important for us to remember that the Word of God says that this is something that we should do in order to help show others that we're followers of Christ. See, taxes, taxes are, are really, I guess what you could say is, what we owe for living in the country that we live in. It's part of what is required to be in the country that we live in. And so Paul kind of grabs that idea there uh, in this next section that we're looking at. And kind of coming off of that idea of, of paying taxes, paying what we owe in taxes. And I guess I'd say he kind of he borrows from that concept uh, in order to, uh, to use this idea of debt in order to communicate a very important truth, and that is that, that showing God's love should be our primary motivation uh, as believers in Christ, because that's going to be the key way that we're showing others about Christ, is by demonstrating this love. So he uses the idea of debt to kind of connect that with us being people who demonstrate love. Notice what he says there in Romans chapter 13 at verse 8. He says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. And I see an important truth in, in uh, that passage right there. And that first thing that I want you to, to grab onto this morning is that when our primary motivation is to show God's love to others, friends, that's the one debt that we never pay off. It's the one debt 
that we always have. You know, oftentimes when we look at that verse in, in Romans, Romans 13, 8, we look at that, we're, we're frequently referring to it in reference to paying off financial debt. And uh, that statement that he, that he makes there at the beginning, he says, let no debt remain outstanding. Well, you know, I mean, there's a pretty clear message in that. You need to pay your financial debts. You need to take care of those things. And that really, it's, it's best to not have debt. It's best to, to not have that, not have financial debt. And I, I just want to say, uh, friends, that I completely agree with that premise. It's absolutely true. You're better off to not have debt if you can. You're better off to be free from financial uh, uh, bondage. And especially, I think we feel that right now in a moment like this. You know, we're all under all these restrictions from the coronavirus and the idea of having a lot of bills to pay is a, is a, difficult, uh, is a difficult thing, you know? And there's a lot of stress about, out there right now in terms of being able to do that. And so the less debt we have, well, that positions us better for tough moments uh, like this. So all of that um, uh, observation about that verse is, is right and true and good. But it's also not exactly what Paul is really trying to emphasize here. See, the greater message that Paul is trying to get at in this illustration that he's using uh, about debt is that it's the believer's responsibility to always express the love of God in all relationships that they have. And so he, he uses that idea of debt as a way of saying that this is the, the one thing that we should always be making payments to. It's the one concept that we should, we should always be doing. This is the one debt that you're never going to pay off. Now, you know, uh, around here at Horizons, uh, we know what it feels like to pay a debt off, don't we? And for those of you that are, are recently joining us and you haven't been around uh, uh, Horizons much, uh, whatever, uh, we want you to know that uh, we had a really great moment earlier uh, this year. Back in uh, January, uh, we were enabled by God to pay off the mortgage uh, for our education building. And man, that was just such a, such a great experience. We paid it off 20 months early, almost two years early early. And man, that felt so good. So in March, March 1st, we had a major celebration. We had a deed burning party. And uh, you can see some of that, uh, that footage right here as we were, we were burning the deed. We were supposed to burn the mortgage, but we burned the deed. Anyway, it was just a copy. Don't worry about it. Uh, anyway, but we, we had so much fun with that. And what we did is we had a big celebration service where we worshiped God for his goodness through song and praise and tacos. Because we bought lunch for everybody afterwards. Man, it was such a great experience. But friends, those of you that were here with us for that, you remember how much joy we had? Remember, remember how much fun it was and how much we were, we were worshiping God? Or maybe, you know, if you weren't with us for that, uh, that moment, you know, maybe you remember a time when you paid off a major debt. You know, it could have been a credit card or a car loan, or maybe you paid off your house. But you remember the joy that you felt, the freedom from that debt? Friend, remember, remember that moment. Take all of that joy that you had in that moment. For us at Horizons, remember how we felt on March 1st. Realizing that where we were was because of God's goodness to us because of God's blessing that he had, he had poured into our church family or into your life. Because of God's blessing, he had given us this great moment. And then think about how eager we were to share that joy with everybody around us. And so here at, here at Horizons, it was about sharing in tacos together. What a great moment, right? Friends, that's the idea that Paul is talking about in this verse. Sharing what God has blessed us with with those who need to hear it. To say it kind of a, another way, 
the Apostle John put it this way in, in 1 John chapter 4. He said, we love because he first loved us. Because of what God has done for us through the gift of salvation in Jesus, you and I, friends, have received an enormous deposit of love. It's a gift, friends, that we can never pay back. But you know what? We'll sure be blessed every single time we make a payment. We'll be blessed deeply and richly through that. And so will the world around us. So will this world around us that's lost in darkness. Because friends, when you're making that payment of love, you're shining. You're shining to a world in darkness. Well, continuing on uh, with uh, verse 9. The Apostle Paul here, he's, he's trying to shore up this, this idea of loving others. And the way that he's going to do that here is he's going to quote from the Old Testament, particularly from the Ten Commandments. All right, also a, a, another passage as well. But let's take a look at what he says there in verse 9. He says, The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So in that verse, Paul quotes from uh, the Ten Commandments from Exodus chapter 20, where we see the uh, Ten Commandments listed. He also quotes from Leviticus 19, what we uh, pointed out uh, before. But as he's doing this, uh, he's actually doing something, something kind, of, kind of interesting here. Uh, he's quoting specific commands, but he's also quoting them out of order. All right, so if you're looking at uh, Exodus chapter 20, where we see the Ten Commandments listed, and if you were to just number them, one through ten, straight on through, the order that Paul gives these uh, commands to us here is number seven, number six, number eight, and number ten. All right, and those particular commands that he's given us there are from what we call the social commands. That is, they're about interacting with other people. All right, all of these commands that he's pointed out are about interacting with people. Now, he could have also included number five and number nine, but Paul's not really about trying to quote them all, and he's also not about trying to quote them in the exact order, uh, which is why he kind of makes that statement there uh, that uh, whatever other command there may be, he kind of categorically just kind of pulls them all in, but he pulls out these ones, uh, specifically, because what he's really trying to do here is he's trying to emphasize for us how the love of God causes us to act toward other people. Now, as you're thinking about that, let me, just, let me just ask you a question. Why did God need to give us the command to not commit adultery? Why did he need to tell us to not murder? or not steal, or to not covet, you know, want something that belongs to somebody else. Why does he need to tell us that? Could it be that because if he didn't, then our nature would be to want to go and do all those things? See, I'm thinking that's, that's probably it. Let me ask you another question. Why does the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12, so the chapter before the one we're looking at right now, why does he need to tell us, in verse 2 of chapter 12, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind? Why does he need to tell us that? Well, could it be because we would follow after the pattern of the world? Could it be because our minds do need to be transformed? They do need to be changed from an old way of thinking to a new way of thinking? I think that's the reason. Now, watch what happens, though. 
Watch what happens when the love of Christ comes into a person's heart. Again, the Apostle Paul writing here in 2 Corinthians 5, he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, so that love has entered that person's life, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. In other words, I'm different. I'm different because of what Christ has done for me. I'm a different person. So I'm not going to treat people the way the world has trained me to treat them. I'm going to treat them the way God wants me to treat them. Which means I'm going to love my neighbor as myself. See, friends, the thing I want you to understand from what Paul is talking about here is that when our primary motivation is is to show that love of God to the people around us, what that does then for us is it changes how we treat people. It just, it it, it comes in and, and, and it changes the way we view them. Changes the way that we interact with them. You know, uh, after uh, World War II, Romania was under communist control from Russia. And the communists that, uh, that were in charge, they desperately wanted to stamp out Christianity throughout that, that country. They wanted to, to impose uh, on everybody the belief in atheism and the communist ideal and all of that. And so as a result of that, the churches that were there in, in Romania were, were uh, under increasing restriction more and more and more. And so Christians started to, to meet in homes. A lot of times they were meeting in those homes uh, secretly. And as you might imagine, there were a lot of people that were thrown into prison as a result of worshiping God. One of the people that was thrown into prison at that time was a pastor named Richard Wormbrand. He was in prison not just for being a Christian and for worshiping and all, but for smuggling Bibles. He was trying to get Bibles to people that, uh, that desperately needed to see and read and know the Word of God. And so because he had been involved with smuggling and there were other people that were helping him doing that, the communists desperately wanted to, wanted to find out the names of all the people that were helping him with this. And so they beat him and tortured him mercilessly, trying to get the names out of him. But to his credit, he never gave up the names. While he was in prison, they would would watch. And every time he would pray or or try to share his faith with, a, with another prisoner, they'd take him out of the, out of the place that he was in and, and go and torture him and beat him again and again and again. One night, when Pastor Wormbrand was praying, as he always did, the torturer, uh, the main torturer for him, uh, burst into uh, his room and just started shouting at him. He says, why do you continue to pray? Everything has been taken from you. We beat you every time that you pray. We've taken your wife away from you. You're never going to see your son again. Why do you continue to do this? Why do you continue to pray for them? And Pastor Wormbrand, he just looked at his torturer and he said, I wasn't praying for them. I was praying for you. How impossible is that to pray for the one who is torturing you? How impossible is that? I mean, the world would look at that and say, you know what, there would have been absolutely nothing wrong with you, Pastor Wormbrand, if you would have hated that torturer. There would be nothing wrong with you just being angry and wanting to, wanting to hurt him back. My friends, Pastor Wormbrand was changed. He was somebody different than he was before. Do you see what happens here? When the, the love of Christ 
comes into our heart, friends, it changes who we are. It changes how we treat people. It makes us different. See, Pastor Wormbrand, he was living out Jesus' words in those moments. Jesus' words that said, love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. He's doing that, friends, because he was changed. He was shining in that moment. Let's look at the last thing that Paul shares with us here in the passage we're looking at. Verse 10. It's a simple statement. It says, Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So, as we saw in, verses, in verse 9, Paul was, was quoting from the Ten Commandments, and he also quotes from Leviticus chapter 19, which are all included in, in what we would identify as the law, the law of God. And in verse 10 there, he, he gives that uh, kind, of a, kind of a final statement, if you will, that, that love uh, does no harm to its neighbor. Love does no harm to your neighbor. More literally, uh, it would be translated, it doesn't do evil to anyone. To anyone. And when you think about that, why would love do evil? Love is the polar opposite of evil. I mean, where love is, evil cannot occupy the same space. Just as uh, the physical properties of light and dark, light, where light is, darkness cannot be. And in the same way, where love is, evil cannot be. So what Paul is really trying to get at here is that if you have the love of Christ in you, then friends, you're not going to be looking for ways to do evil. You're not going to be looking for ways to, to do evil to your neighbor. You're going to be looking for ways to love them because that's what love does. In other words, it's the love of Christ that keeps us from committing adultery. It keeps us from trying to murder people or steal or covet. See how this works? Now, I think we have to be honest and say, are we perfect at this? <laughs> no, of course not. But when we do follow the love of Christ that has been implanted within us, then friends, it keeps us away from stuff like that. It keeps us away from all the things that the law was telling us we shouldn't do. It's the love of Christ that enables me to do that. It's the love of Christ that enables me to love my neighbor as myself. See, friends, when our primary motivation is to show God's love, we fulfill the law of God. And that's what Paul is trying to, trying to tell us here. You know, Jesus one time was, uh, was asked, what's the greatest commandment from the law? And you remember his response? He, he said this in uh, Matthew 22. He replies, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And then he says, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So he's quoting that Leviticus passage. He says, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Friends, the key word in Jesus' response to that question, is love. That's what he's trying to drive home to us. 
despite the fact that we often uh, will look at the Old Testament and see it as a bunch of rules and regulations, what it's really full of (laughs) is love. That's the testimony that comes from the law. In fact, probably the best way to sum it all up is the way the Apostle John spoke about it in the Gospel of John in the world's most popular Bible verse. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Friends, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then that love that God has for the whole world, for all of us, that's been implanted in you. It's been implanted in you. So that's why, friends, I guess I, I'll say is the, the bottom line for the whole thing that we're, that we're thinking about today in this message. Friends, believers shine and we do everything in God's love. You've been given a debt of love that you cannot repay. But God still wants you to make the payments. He wants you to do that. Because when you do that, you shine with the love of God to a world trapped in darkness. Let's pray together. Holy Father, uh, we live in a world that is a little bit scary right now. And so I ask, Lord, on behalf of our, our church family, that, that we, wouldn't, we wouldn't live in fear, but rather we would live in love. That we would be bright examples of your, your grace and your mercy to the world around us. May we show your love through everything that we do. May we demonstrate that that love that you have planted within us to everybody around us. Lord, we thank you so much that you loved us so much that you were willing to send your son to die on the cross for our sins. But you know what? We also thank you that he didn't stay on the cross and, and, and when he was placed in the grave, he didn't stay in the grave. No, Lord, he he came out completely victorious over our sin, giving us that love that is planted deep within us. May we be people who shine the light of your love to everyone around us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You're the 
much for joining us here at Horizons. And typically we end the service by inviting you to join our prayer partners up front. But if you go to the connect page and scroll to the bottom, you'll find a form where you can submit your prayers uh, and our staff and prayer partners will be praying with and for you during the season. Uh, would you pray with me, church, to finish off the service? Heavenly Father, we know who you are as our God. We know you are faithful, you are true, you do not forsake, you do not leave. God, so during this time, we place our hope and our faith in the never-changing, ever-faithful God. Lord, we love you, we worship you together as your people. In your name we pray, amen.
Thanks for joining us on Sunday morning. I'm Zach, the youth pastor here at Horizons, and I just wanted to tune you in. Uh, if your morning looks anything like this, we want to make that better. Uh, you can join us at 1030 on HCC Youth, uh, our Facebook page for a live Bible study where we'd love to hear uh, from you guys in the comment section, and you guys can tag along as we look into God's Word. Uh, also on our website, horizonsyouth.com. Uh, we have a parent survey. It is our plan to best serve uh, families and their students uh, during this time of social distancing and quarantine through Zoom meetings, which is what I'm using to record this message on. We would love for your feedback. So we would love for you to go to horizonsyouth.com, check out our two question survey for parents, and we'll get back to you. Have a blessed Sunday. Thanks again. Hey, Horizons parents, uh, just wanted to take a moment to let you know all the ways that uh, we're trying to help your kids stay connected to our church family during this time. And the first is really right after this service. Uh, no later than 1015, we will have the kids lesson video, their Bible lesson uploaded to the Kids on the Horizon Facebook page. And it'll be there for them to view. And that's basically just like our lesson that we do every Sunday when we're all able to gather together. Uh, we've just uh, moved it to video and uploaded it to that Facebook page. So make sure you go there and let your kids check that out. Uh, we will also be posting the so-and-so show uh, every single week following that. And if you don't know what that is, that's okay. Your kids do. And uh, parents watch it with them. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but it's just another great way to reinforce the lesson for the Sunday. Then, of course, we'll be posting uh, plenty of other supplemental videos and uh, resources and things like that to our Facebook page as well. Uh, so be checking throughout the week and uh, get on there and, and look and see what opportunities are there. One of the things that I uploaded just recently was a 30-day challenge, a devotional challenge for your kids that you can go on and uh, you sign up for them and then each day it provides a new devotional with some uh, Bible reading that they can do and some activities to follow up and all that fun stuff. So take advantage of that. And then lastly, just want you guys to know your, your kids' teachers are really missing them. And they're looking uh, forward to being able to see them again. But in the meantime, they really want to reach out to you and connect with your kids. So we're going to provide them with your email addresses. And they're going to reach out to you and see if it's okay to... Uh, give you guys a call and talk to your kids or maybe even set up a Zoom session, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, but be looking forward to that call from uh, your teachers or that contact via email uh, from your kids' teachers, uh, hopefully in the next week or so. All right. Well, that's it for now. And uh, if you have any questions, by all means, don't hesitate to reach out to me. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye.